It's a good morning, isn't it? The fog has cleared. It's a beautiful day out. And uh, thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. That's a beautiful, beautiful song. Uh, well, before we get started, uh, let's look at some looking ahead stuff. Uh, you'll see the two-week calendar and the uh, detail list on the back. But also, everybody should have gotten in their bulletin one of these double-sided flyers. Um, so one side talks about our family Easter festival coming up on April the 9th. That's a Saturday, uh, a couple Saturdays from now. Not this upcoming one, but the next. And the other side talks about our Good Friday Choir Cantata, which is going to be on uh, Good Friday, of course. That's a, a few Fridays from now. But this is um, not so much for you. You know about it already, right? It's not so much for you. With, right? It's a tool. It's, it's given to you to pass it around town, spread the word. Um, also on Facebook, you might have seen this week that uh, we've got some Facebook posts going around. If you can share those, that helps spread the word for these, these events. Um, great Easter things coming up to, um, to, to prepare our hearts for the Easter season. I, I'm particularly excited. Janet, our children's ministry director, has been so creative this year with the Easter festival. Um, it's, it's interactive, five different stations that help the kids fully understand the Easter story. It's going to be a great Saturday at the Easter festival. Um, so those are some things coming down the, the pipeline, if you will. Now this week, you can see inside your bulletin, there are two things I underlined. I had my dates wrong last week. So last week I was talking about the book blessing planning meeting. That's actually this Thursday at 6. I had it in my mind that it was last Thursday. It's this Thursday at 6. But also Tuesday at 3 p.m., there's a group of people here in town that are getting together to talk about uh, relaunching an Alzheimer's support group uh, through the church. So they're meeting at the church, 3 p.m. on Tuesday, and I want to invite um, anybody who wants to be a part of that conversation uh, to come out and, and, uh, and help us plan for that. So um, those are the two main things. You can see standard stuff coming up, um, children's ministry this week. Now, we'll say about children's ministry, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday is the children Easter play. And I, I, I encourage you, highly encourage you to make plans to be at that play. Uh, last Sunday, y'all know I was praying fervently that God's grace help us prepare for this play. I can, I can testify that this Wednesday, God's grace was in it. We are almost ready for the play, and it's going to be adorable. So uh, make plans. This, this upcoming Wednesday is our last true rehearsal, and then we'll do the play. So uh, exciting stuff happening. Um, so I think that that's all the things that need said. Um, well, no, I just thought of another thing. Easter lily forms are not in the bulletins this week, but they are an, on the side here and in the foyer, Janet's telling me. So if you'd like to order an Easter lily for our Easter Sunday service, uh, make sure to grab one of those. Okay, now I think that's it. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful to be in your house this morning. God, we know that you are always with us. And yet we're also thankful for these weekly rhythms of pausing and letting you speak directly to our hearts. So God, we are yours. We prepare ourselves to enter into your courts with thanksgiving and praise. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and, and sing My Hope is Built together. Verse 1 through 3. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. Heart
That's a really hard prayer to truly mean in our hearts, isn't it? I think so. I think oftentimes, deep in our hearts, we think of being elsewhere than in the presence of God. And yet the truth is, truth of the story is there is no better place to be um, and that song we the other song we sing um, are you weak and heavy laden take it to the Lord in prayer uh, is so true so often we we don't cling to the source of life better is one day in the courts of God than thousands elsewhere may that be a prayer we truly mean would you turn with me to the back of the, the bulletin as we go to a time of prayer together The only new prayer request that um, I've heard about this week is uh, not on the bulletin. I, I learned of it this morning. Um, Mike Merringer, that's the brother of uh, Pam and, and Judy, um, he's going to be having foot surgery tomorrow morning. It's, it sounds like it's pretty extensive foot surgery. So um, they've asked for prayers for him as he prepares for that. Um, otherwise, I haven't heard of any prayer needs. That doesn't mean there are not prayer needs. I just haven't heard of anything to add to our list. Um, so as we pray this morning, I encourage you to lift up those needs, lift up those requests as we go to God uh, in prayer together. First in silent prayer, and then I'll lead us as a congregation. Let's pray. Father, it is good to be in your house. It is good to know your presence near to us. It's good to know that you care for us in ways and in places and times that we don't always see and notice. And yet, God, you are faithful time and time again. It truly is better to be in your presence than anywhere else. And so, God, on this Sunday morning, we give you thanks for the story of Easter, for Christ dying in our place, conquering death, and even on to that gift of the Holy Spirit as, God, you gave birth to your church. I especially think of that gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the nearness of your presence, walking with us every step, empowering us, Father, we give you thanks, for you truly are our comfort, even when we walk through the valley of shadow of death. Father, this morning we especially pray for Mike, that as he prepares for surgery tomorrow morning, that God, he would feel your comfort. The doctors may have your wisdom, your guidance, that God might, might have your peace. Father, there are definitely many other prayer needs we can name before you. Many other things to bring to your throne. We trust, God, that you hear them all. You hold them all. And so now, Father, in full confidence of your grace, we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. With the 
ushers come forward for a time of offering. As they come forward, let me give us our, our mission moment for today. Um, mission moment for today, I want us, a few people have asked about missionary conference this year. So in case you don't know, I know many of us, probably all of us do know, but I'm going to say it like we don't. Um, our congregation has a list, long list of missionaries that we support, missionaries and different missions agencies that we support in our missions fund. And once every year we have a missions conference to celebrate all those ministries and to also raise support for those missions as we um, su support uh, extending beyond ourselves. So missionary conference this year is going to be May the 22nd. May the 22nd, it'll be after Easter, um, after Mother's Day too, uh, May the 22nd. And it's the 60th missionary conference of this church. So that's really a big celebration. And the surprise on, on, around uh, town talk is Glenn Spann is going to be the speaker. Um, many of y'all know Harold Spann was the pastor who started the missionary uh, fund the missionary uh, movement of the church back when he was pastor here in the 60s. Uh, Glenn is his son, so it's very appropriate for him to come out. I'm excited about missionary conference, and I just wanted you to be uh, excited also. Get the word of that. So let's pray together. Father, we are thankful. We're thankful for your mercies that are new every morning. We're thankful for the breath that we breathe right now in this place. We thankful, God, that when we fall down, you don't leave us there. You are faithful to reach out to us, to pull us up from the miry clay, set our feet back on a rock, God, all these reasons and more to come in this moment to offer ourselves as a sacrifice of praise, as a living sacrifice. God, in these moments of offering, we want to give our whole hearts to you, our whole lives to you, that we might truly mirror your love in the world. So God, we lift this offering up to you asking that you bless it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Safety in the distance, where is out of sight and mind? My life was unexamined for fear of what I'd find. And once again in solitude, my soul is unfulfilled. Then I step through the crowd and step toward the hill. Protected a cross, the more I clearly see the holiness of you and the sinfulness in me. There's a beauty in the agony that draws me to this place. The closer I get to the cross, the more amazed I am. the truth of everything you've done for me and what I've done to you. But here my eyes are open and it breaks my heart to know just how 
deep the roots of all my failures grow. The closer I get to the cross, the more I clearly see the holiness of you and the sinfulness in me. There's a beauty in the agony that draws me to this place. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning comes from Psalm 107. Psalm 107. I'm going to read the first 22 verses of Psalm 107. It's titled, at least in, in my Bible, the heading here is Thanksgiving for Deliverance from Many Troubles. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in gloom, prisoners in misery and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Their hearts were bowed down with hard labor. They fell down with no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and gloom and broke their bonds asunder. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. And 
let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Martin Luther, a man who changed the entire shape of Christianity. Now, I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. I'm talking about Martin Luther from the 16th century. The man who challenged the authority of, of Rome's Pope. The man who nailed 95 theses on the castle door in Wittenberg, Germany. An act that set into motion the entire Protestant tradition of Christianity an act that eventually led to the formation of the Methodist movement in the 18th century. This Martin Luther, the great reformer of the church, this Martin Luther once had a twisted view of God. A twisted view of God even while he was serving as a monk faithfully in a monastery. He says it himself. He says he was afraid of God, afraid of God's judgment, afraid of never quite meeting God's standards, always trying to appease God's wrath, always trying to please God's will. That's why he went to the monastery in the first place. He took strict vows and committed himself to extreme discipline just to gain the favor of God. And he didn't yet realize in those early days of his faith how twisted his view of God had become. Years earlier, he left home to escape his father. A cruel man with high expectations, harsh discipline. Luther's father physically and emotionally abused Luther until the day he left home. In fact, Martin Luther battled with that early childhood trauma for the majority of his adult life. Bouts of depression, fits of anger, sleepless nights of bitter memories. The great reformer of the church, Martin Luther, dealt with it all. And what he didn't realize until the day of his conversion, what he couldn't quite see as he was making those monastery vows in the early days of his faith, Luther's entire image of God reflected the harsh judgment of his over-demanding father. That's how he saw God. In fact, that's why he went to the monastery in the first place. He thought it was the only way to please his heavenly father. In fact, in those early days of Luther's life, he, he wrote these words I'm about to read after a mentor asked him if he loved God. Luther says, love God? How can I love God? I don't love God. I fear God. I hate God. Truth is, young Luther didn't really know God. What is your name? That's the question we've been pondering as we followed the life of Jacob, as we journeyed through this sermon series following Jacob's faith. What is your name? It's a question we ask ourselves again and again through all different stages of life as we invent and reinvent who we are. What is your name? It's also a question we ask of God again and again all throughout life. As we try to figure out the God we worship, as we try to figure out who exactly God is, what is is your name? You know, as as I ponder this, this passage of Scripture I'm about to read this morning, I can't help but think about Luther's story. Because he was asking God and himself the exact same question. Oftentimes we we walk around with a skewed view of God, an identity of who God is that really mirrors our own inward.
word struggles. We don't quite realize we've been projecting all our problems onto God. Oftentimes, it, it takes a deep encounter with God before we know who exactly God is. Before we meet the God who meets us in the mess. That's Jacob's story. That's Jacob's story. Wrestling with God until he finally meets the God who meets us in the mess. And today, we find a climax to Jacob's story in Genesis 32. As the story begins, we meet yet again Esau, Jacob's older brother, Jacob's violent older brother, as, as Esau is marching Jacob's way, ready to exact revenge. As the story begins, Jacob has no choice but to confront all those struggles of his entire life, to come face to face with the brother he deceived. This is Genesis 32. If you want to follow along here, it's on the screens. You can find it as well. Genesis 32. I'm going to read verses 3 through 12. Hear the word of God. Now Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Sire, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have lived with Laban as an alien and stayed until now. And I have oxen and donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves, and I have sent to tell my lord in order that I might find favor in your sight." In other words, Jacob sends his messengers ahead to Esau to try to scope out what's going on, to try to tell Esau, hey, I've got gifts I can offer you. Verse 6, the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that were with him, the flocks and herds and camels, into two companies, thinking if Esau comes to the one company and destroys it, then the company that's left will escape. You can hear the desperation in his voice as he's making a plan, trying to figure out what to do next. And now he hits his knees and turns to God in prayer. Verse 9, Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all your steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you've shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan, and now I've become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. You know, I can almost see the sweat collecting on Jacob's brow as he paces back and forth, back and forth, trying to figure out what to do next as Esau marches towards him. I mean, his older brother Esau has every right to come with horse and buggy, chariot and warrior, and take everything from Jacob. Because after all, it was Esau's blessing and Esau's inheritance that Jacob stole in the first place. And it seems that in all these years since the two brothers last met, Esau has amassed quite an army. 400 men is nothing to laugh about. These are warriors trained for the attack. No wonder Jacob cries out to God in desperation. 
I mean, Jacob is toting around women and children, pots and pans, servants and livestock, all the basic necessities of life. He's not marching on the desert plain with an army. (laughs) Jacob is vulnerable. Everything he owns marches with him in that caravan. And Esau could wipe it all out in a single blow. And so Jacob hatches a, a desperate plan. He divides everything he owns into two companies. One goes right, the other goes left. Esau would have to attack one or the other. He couldn't have both. It's a brilliant plan, really. And he does something else, and it's a little bit further on. I didn't read it. He starts sending Esau gifts, droves of gifts, in fact, three droves of cattle and shepherds as gifts. The first drove, he sends a hundred head of cattle Esau's way with enough shepherds to take care of the whole lot. And as Esau sees the cattle coming over the hill, he wonders, where's Jacob? And just as he gets to ask the servant, where's Jacob? Another drove of cattle comes over the hill. Where's Jacob? Yet again, a third drove of cattle comes over the hill. 550 head of cattle in total, Jacob sends to Esau, trying to appease his wrath, trying to offer him gifts. And it's brilliant what Jacob does. Not only has he protected half of his camp, But he also just got rid of the one thing holding him back from a last-ditch effort into the wilderness on his own. You can't run fast with 550 head of cattle. You cannot hide in a cave or behind a bush if you've got 550 head of cattle surrounding you. But now Jacob is free. Now he can save his skin. As the sun goes down, Jacob sends the last bit of his belongings to safety. His wives, his children, everything he has left. He sends them off ahead in the complete opposite direction. As he watches them cross the river of Jabek, as the sun begins to go down, we find Jacob yet again all alone. And that's really where the story for this morning begins. Look with me at verse 22 of Genesis 32. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, his 11 children, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Confusion, pitch black darkness, the wrestling that stills our sleep all night long. We've all been there in that wrestling place. Jacob wrestles with Esau. Or is it someone else? I mean, how could Jacob know? It's pitch black night there in the the dead of the desert. And the match, it, it, it goes on relentlessly. On and on and on until the break of day. And with Jacob, we stand there exhausted as the morning light finally starts to creep across the horizon. It's a brief moment of clarity. A brief pause where Jacob can see a bit better. This can't be Esau, Jacob thinks to himself in a moment of distraction. And that's all it takes, that one moment of distraction. The man strikes him on the hip, and a searing pain 
shoots through Jacob's side. This can't be Esau. It just can't be Esau, Jacob says to himself. Verse 26. Then the man said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Ooh, he knows it's not Esau now. Verse 27, so he said to him, what is your name? And Jacob said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. What is your name? You know, it's funny because I've been wondering the same thing about you. What is your name, son? Jacob. It's Jacob. No, that's not your name. What? I've been known as Jacob since my youth. No, that's not your name. Your name is Israel. Because, son, you just fought with God. Look with me at verse 29. Then Jacob asked, then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he says, why is it that you ask my name? And there the man blessed Jacob. So Jacob called the place Peniel, face to face with God saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Israel. That's what the, the angel that's representing God names Jacob. Israel. A name that means wrestles with God. Israel, a name that in Hebrew also means God wrestles with you. So which is it? What name does God give Jacob? Does God name Jacob the guy who wrestles with God? Or does God name Jacob God wrestles with you? Please tell me your name, Jacob says in verse 29. And God responds, Why is it that you ask my name? Haven't you already learned my name? Tell me about that limp there on your side. Tell me about that desert wandering you've been going through for most of your life. Tell me about that lonely place, that rock bottom place. Tell me about Bethel. Haven't you already met me? Don't you know my name? Who, dear Jacob, has wrestled with you all these years of your desert wandering? It's a beautiful story. <laughs> this is Jacob's heart-changing moment. This is where Jacob moves from mere belief to true faith. This is when God becomes Jacob's God and not just the God of his fathers. It's when Jacob realizes that God is the only one in this life who has wrestled with him through the struggle in every high and every low. It's when the sun breaks upon a new dawn for Jacob and he sees for the first time that God is the only one who has ever cared to get down to the lowest place with Jacob and meet him in the thick of the mess. That is who God is. God is Israel, the one who wrestles with us. The God who has the audacity, the love to be named with us in our mess. And that is who we are. We are Israel. 
the ones who wrestle with God, the ones who fight God tooth and nail through the darkest nights, the ones who get ourselves into that rock bottom place without any help from anyone else. But that's the beauty of the gospel, isn't it? That's why Jesus dying on the cross means anything at all. It's the story of God wrestling with our death. The story of God fighting our darkness. It's the story of God offering to us a new name, marking us with a new walk, a new dawn, a new life. The beauty of the gospel is this. We don't have to journey through the mess all on our own. Because it turns out God has been with us there at our side all along, calling us home, offering us a new name. That's the story of Easter. That's the mercy of God. That God would meet us there in the wrestling of our lives and choose to be identified with us. All to lift us up. All to pick us up from that miry clay. So may we fully embrace the grace and gospel of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Friends, we're getting really close to Easter. And as we finish today, we blow out the fourth, the, the candle for the fourth Sunday of Lent. Let's sing the fourth verse to Just As I Am together. Just as I am poor, wretched, blind, Side riches healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And here at the end of the month, you know, we gather around the bap baptismal font to remember all of God's good grace on our lives, God's faithfulness to make us new again and again. So as we remember our baptism, let us go to God in prayer together. Father, we give you thanks that you have always met us in those dark nights we think all the way back to the moment of creation, God, when your spirit was stirring over the chaos of those early waters. And you made of that chaos something beautiful. And God, time and time again, you've never stopped making beauty from the ashes, making order from the chaos, wrestling with us all along the way. God, in these moments where we pause and remember that it's only by your grace that we have been, become children of God, as we pause and remember our baptism, this whole story of our faith, Father, we give you thanks for wrestling with us, for choosing to be known as the God who wrestles with us. And so, Father, we remember our baptism and we are thankful. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all God's people said, amen and amen. As always, I encourage you after service to come and just touch the water. It's not a baptism. There's a good tangible way to remember God's promises, to renew our own covenant commitment with God and just reset again for another month as we lean into April. Let's stand together and sing one more hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And I'm down front if you'd like to make any response 
of faith. Let's sing this together. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded. Still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Savior, today. Wash me just now, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly. Verse 4 this time. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Amen and amen. Friends, may we go from this place ready to embrace the God who has always embraced us, ready to, to give it all yet again to God this week. Uh, the God who wrestles with us, the God who works in us in so many ways. May we go from here in the peace and love and grace of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.